Mi sentite? Sì. Ah, perfetto, sono riuscito a trovare un device <ride> relativo. Oh. <ride> Bene, wait just a minute. All right, it's uh, 4.02, maybe we can start. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to today's uh, Sisters Colloquium by Professor Antonino Cattaneo from Scuola Normale Superiore and Levi Montalcini European Brain Research Institute. Besides being a prominent member of the scientific community, Professor Cattaneo is well known and dear to CISA, where he was crucial to the development of the neuroscience area. We will hear more about that uh, uh, from Professors uh, Tacol and Malamachi, so let me immediately leave the floor to them, please. Audio. Audio. Good afternoon. Thank you for being here. And uh, today we are pleased to welcome Professor Antonino Cattaneo, a very special guest from the Scuola Normale Superiore in Pisa and president of the Levi Montalcini European Brain Research Institute. Antonino is a great friend of CISA, where he served as a head of the biophysics sector and deputy director. 20 years ago, he also took part in setting up the neuroscience program in CISA. Personally, I have fond memories of Antonino, always smiling and spurring students with positive comments and suggestions. Antonino Catania is an outstanding neurobiologist who studies how long-term changes in the efficacy of synaptic connections underlie learning and memory in the brain. Antonino capitalized on the great lessons by two Nobel Prize mentors in both the molecular mechanisms of neuronal differentiation and the production of monoclonal antibodies. He exploited this tremendous knowledge to develop a groundbreaking research line aimed at finding new therapies for neurodegenerative diseases. Antonino is an inventor of many patented biomedical technologies, while some humanized recombinant antibodies developed in his lab are currently under clinical testing in humans. And today he will share with us his expert opinion on the development of new technologies and the experimental strategies for interfering with protein functions in living neurons in a spatially and temporally precise fashion to probe the synaptic plasticity theory of memory. With that, I ask you to give your full attention to Antonino Cattaneo and please help me welcome him to the virtual stage. Before leaving the floor to Antonino, I'm sure that Antonello Malamacci, the coordinator of the neuroscience department, would like to say a few words about our friend Antonino. Please, Antonello, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Giuliano. It is uh, really a pleasure having uh, Antonino today as, uh, as a guest. I will not take uh, so, much, uh, so much time. Uh, as you all know, Antonino did a lot of extremely interesting and smart things. Uh, but what impressed me uh, enormously is uh, uh, his uh, original and creative way of thinking and, and doing. And from this point of view, he's really an example for new students in particular nowadays. 
uh, just uh, I like to, to make some, some examples. For example, he was able to turn a, let's say, misfunctioning protein uh, peculiar to some neurological patients in a powerful therapeutic tool that now is being tested to counteract uh, Alzheimer's disease progression, for example. This is, this is striking. Uh, he developed, as uh, was already said, the intrabody. So these are small miniaturized uh, antibodies that represent one of the very first uh, tools that allow us uh, to target uh, specific uh, post-translational configurations and conformations of our, our protein and proteins. And uh, finally, finally, uh, he uh, has developed, and it is the subject of the presentation of uh, today, uh, an extremely smart new methodology for uh, uh, probing, for experimentally probing uh, the theory of memory dynamics. Uh, so up to now, uh, neurons uh, involved in the formation of engrams, so these ensembles linked to the formation and the dynamics of, uh, of memories uh, were uh, mainly labeled and perturbed at uh, wall cell level. Okay. Antonino went a little bit ahead, so he put together a number of smart tricks, smart tricks and was able to build a new technology that allows to label uh, specific uh, contacts uh, among neurons. So those specific contacts were, as a consequence of the previous activity of neurons, uh, uh, the transmission is somehow enhanced. So he's able to stain this, uh, these regions and he's able to perturb this region according to a given plan. And this, is a, a, this, this for sure will lead to dramatic advancements, advancements in, this, uh, in this field. So I don't want to take uh, more, uh, more time. Uh, so Antonino, uh, please, the stage is, uh, is to you. Well, thank you to the three of you. Thank you, Andrea Romanino. Thank you, Giuliano. And thank you, Antonello, for this uh, introduction that I think really do not deserve. But I'm very pleased to talk at CISA. Uh, it's a place where I have my heart. Uh, it's a place where I have uh, great friends and colleagues, and is a place, uh, uh, is an institution where I have spent uh, a long and very, very happy period of my scientific life. And uh, so the only regret today is not being able to be there in person, uh, but I'm sure there will be soon a, an occasion at least to, to, to drink together. And uh, so thank you very much for this opportunity. And I'd like to spend two words. Uh, one of the reasons that made uh, the period of my period of CISA so, so happy and enthusiastic, it was an heroic time. And this is due to a great person that is Daniele Amati. I like to start my talk today thanking Daniele for having believed uh, in a young uh, and a bit enthusiastic uh, young scientist. And he decided that um, he could share with me uh, his vision to bring neurosciences at CISA. And uh, I was so happy to follow him in his vision. It was uh, so nice to see how a long visionary project uh, from uh, a person who was doing totally different uh, uh, science uh, uh, would sponsor so enthusiastically neurosciences and it was really enthusiastic to be part of building uh, uh, of starting a neurosciences at CISA and uh, I'd like to remember our students in those times we had labs without walls really for instance my uh, the molecular biology lab that was a lab that uh, where I had uh, my own group uh, um, it was full of uh, PhD students from our electrophysiologist colleagues. And this was in the, uh, in the very early 90s. And it was not at all obvious. And we asked that our students, each of our students should have a hand-on uh, project uh, in, in, in the other camp uh, uh, in order to get uh, his or her PhD. And uh, I think that this trained uh, a new generation of, I like thinking that this trained a new generation of, of young scientists and many, many of, of, uh, of these are now established neuroscientists. And so thank you, Atsisa. Thank you, Daniela Mati. So um, let me just uh, share my 
Okay, so today I will uh, uh, talk to you about, uh, um, let me just, uh, yes, about uh, a new um, experimental approach that I have uh, uh, started a few years ago. And what I will uh, do today is uh, I will take you through this, uh, uh, through this, um, uh, I'm trying to, to, to sorry, screw that enough. Okay. Yes, sorry. So what I will do today is, is uh, I, I won't tell you a complete story. I will tell you about this uh, 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 work in progress strategy that we are working on. And uh, I will try to uh, tell you the motivation that uh, took us into, into this new uh, 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 venture. So the overarching aim of, uh, of my lab in the past 20 years uh, or so has been uh, to try to understand uh, uh, Alzheimer's disease, the mechanism with the aim of, uh, of uh, developing a, a new experimental, uh, new therapies. That is a, a very serious problem in, uh, globally. And as you all know, I won't uh, discuss uh, more about this, but there is a huge frustration because despite the intensive research, now in 2021, we are still back to square one. We still have no drug approved uh, in the past 20 years. Also the most recent, uh, actually, this is a, uh, uh, there is a recently uh, approved aducanumab drug, but uh, there are many, many doubts that this uh, uh, will work. Uh, the approval of aducanumab is still subject to big debate. So basically, uh, despite intensive research, there is yet no cure for Alzheimer's disease and there is no cure in sight. So it is clear that in 30 years uh, uh, as a community, we have been doing something wrong. And, uh, and I think that thinking about what uh, 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 as a community we may have done wrong, uh, we can spend more than a seminar on this, but I'd like only to tell you a couple of things because this is the motivation behind what I'm going to tell you today. So uh, uh, um, we, we study uh, uh, Alzheimer's disease from the point of view of the endpoints of the disease and the two endpoints of the disease are uh, uh, amyloid, uh, uh, the A-beta peptide that forms the uh, A-beta plaques and the neurofibrillate tangles that are formed by the microtubule associated protein tau. And there are very good reasons uh, 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 to start from these two misfolded proteins and then trying to, to go up and trying to inhibit these proteins because uh, uh, there is very strong evidence that uh, these two pro misfolded proteins are uh, 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 crucially involved in the mechanism of neurodegeneration. Uh, for amyloid, there is a very strong genetic evidence, so I, I won't keep you on this. So based on this, uh, uh, 20 years of, uh, of therapeutic, uh, 25 years of therapeutic approaches have targeted uh, uh, abeta, uh, abeta uh, 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 peptide in the extracellular environment. And also tau, despite being a, an intracellular protein, uh, current therapies that do not seem uh, to work so well, uh, it is a bit behind, but still uh, there are many, many doubts. Uh, uh, tau is being targeted with antibodies, therapeutic antibodies that target the protein in the extracellular environment. So this is what I call the extracellular view of uh, Alzheimer's disease. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, probably because antibodies can only access uh, in the standard way, the extracellular environment, this is how uh, different uh, therapeutic antibodies are targeting uh, 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 the, 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 the misfolded proteins in the extracellular neuronal environment. So uh, currently uh, the main focus of the paradigm change that is needed is uh, to focus on early diagnosis, earlier diagnosis. And this is for sure a very important thing to, to and so this, uh, and there is even the hope in many that if we could uh, diagnose uh, 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 Alzheimer's disease earlier, some of the failed drugs might even, might even uh, work. And of course, we all hope that this is the case. We are convinced also of a different, uh, uh, different uh, uh, point. Uh, and uh, the, these two points are that uh, 
uh, we should need uh, to focus on the intracellular and cell autonomous phase of the disease. I will say two words of this in a second. And the second point is that uh, um, Alzheimer's is a disease of, uh, that affects memory, yet in any uh, serious way, the Alzheimer camp does not really study me physiological mechanisms of memory. So this second point is going to be the motivation for why we started uh, uh, four or fi five years ago to uh, uh, tackle uh, the physiology of memory with new tools uh, to then uh, go towards uh, the pathology of memory. And uh, uh, so the intracellular view of Alzheimer's disease as opposed to the mainly extracellular view uh, uh, starts from the consideration that all misfolded proteins start intracellularly. Also the abeta that is, uh, in, this is a cartoon that you will find in any review on abeta. Abeta is found to be cleaved on the outer membrane and then being deposited outside. Yet we and others have shown that the first site where a beta is cleaved is the endoplasmic reticulum, is inside the neuron. And that is where the first damage is done. So you need to consider that uh, you need to target the intracellular cell autonomous and, and a fortiori early phase of neurodegeneration. And uh, uh, the way how we are doing this is, is by a new approach that has been mentioned by by uh, uh, Giuliano and Antonello that we have pioneered many years ago, that is using antibodies as genes, intracellular antibodies with which we can do subcellular pharmacology, as we say. We can target antibody genes in different compartments of a neuron. And so we can really be very local with this approach. So by this approach over the, uh, we have, uh, uh, we are able to molecularly precisely target conformation uh, and pathological conformation of proteins, and or we can also target uh, uh, post-translational pools of a given protein. We are targeting uh, a beta oligomers inside the endoplasmic reticulum, and we are targeting phospho tau, uh, only the phosphorated pool of tau inside neurons. And uh, so basically we have the vision that we need uh, 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 to achieve a, an intracellular gene therapy for Alzheimer's disease. But this is not the topic of, uh, this is where we are heading as a lab, but uh, today I want to tell you something else. As I told you, we need to create a connection between Alzheimer's disease and memory mechanistic studies. There is a gap here. And, he, and, and our hope is that when, as when you, these are pictures from the uh, uh, Tunnel del Monte Bianco, and when you, when you dig a tunnel from two sides, uh, uh, you, 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 you accelerate the moment in which you, you really have the light uh, through the tunnel. And, and so studying the physiology of memory uh, alongside with, with uh, studying Alzheimer's disease from the point of view of, uh, of, uh, of the target misfolded proteins uh, is a way how we should create a link to accelerate uh, our understanding of what goes wrong in Alzheimer's disease. And studying memory, we should also realize that uh, uh, forgetting is not pathological per se. These are two quotes from some great, uh, 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 William James is the, is the father of uh, modern psychology and uh, Theodule Armand Ribot is uh, a great physiologist of the 29th century. And you all realize that there is a physiological uh, 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 forgetting that is at the basis of, uh, uh, of our memory. So in order to remember, you need to forget. So studying physiological memory is where I will uh, take you through today. And for this reason, this again is a real start of, of, of today's uh, uh, talk uh, about this approach that we, uh, I wanted to tell you our motivation to go uh, into studying uh, 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 the, the physiology of memory as, as our own way to, and, and really it is not so common in the field of Alzheimer's disease. And I, 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 I make the, the case that it should be uh, uh, really uh, 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 more heavily uh, uh, investigated. But uh, uh, the reason is also that the memory studies in the, have made tremendous progress in the past uh, uh, years. And so we should leverage these. And, uh, uh, so, so uh, I want to tell you our motivations, but now we shall go into what we know about uh, uh, the physiology of memory. So 
uh, already the, the 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 old philosophers uh, uh, Plato and uh, and uh, and uh, Agostino and throughout the centuries uh, they all and and uh, Locke and many many others have uh, throughout the centuries have have imagined as a metaphor that there is a trace that is being written in the brain when you learn and remember and uh, uh, this was translated in a very uh, catchy uh, uh, and sexy word by Richard Simon, a psychologist of the uh, uh, early 20th century, uh, Richard Simon uh, coined the, the, the word engram uh, from the Greek to write, and, uh, and, and he defined an engram as enduring, uh, though primarily latent modification in the irritable substance produced by a stimulus, I have called an engram. And the modern definition of an engram was that an engram is a physical, has three properties. It is something that is written with some suitable technology in the brain when you encode a, a, a stimulus, for instance, a stimulus that encodes a, 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 a learning experience, a, an episode. It is enduring. And then it, 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 uh, when you recall the stimulus that were part of the encoding set, uh, these, uh, this trace gets reactivated. And when I started as a student uh, uh, to get interested in neuroscience uh, many, many years ago, uh, uh, the word engram was a magic word that was uh, absolutely out of sight uh, of any possible experimental uh, 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 investigation. It was one of those words that was a, a word for the future. And now the future has come. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and so this is the reason, in, particularly in the past, uh, 20 years, uh, um, a whole field has grown into uh, linked to engram uh, uh, technologies, as I call them. And, uh, and this is, is what we should leverage to study uh, also the pathology of, me of memory. And, and the key, uh, one key point is that uh, what we call uh, uh, activity mapping. When uh, you uh, stimulate, uh, produce, uh, you, you, you deliver a stimulus to the brain in an appropriate area of the brain, uh, neurons get activated, get electrically active, get synaptically activated. And uh, since the brain is not only an electrical machine, and I like uh, uh, to my students, I always say that uh, 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 it is much more than electrical machine. And there is uh, uh, lots of, uh, of important things that go on at the level of the, of the genome of neurons. And one of these things is that neurons get uh, 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 electrical activation of neurons, uh, uh, activates uh, uh, transcription of new genes. And one of family of genes that gets activated is uh, called the metaly genes. So uh, 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 this is shown here, for instance, this shows that when you move uh, 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 an experimental animal from a home cage to a, to a new environment. Uh, these neurons, uh, in this case, we are in the hippocampus, are uh, all neurons are labeled in green, but uh, if you have a probe that uh, uh, measures the activation of the metaly gene in red, you see that these, these genes get uh, activated. And, and you can have a measure of their activation by looking at the transcription of the metaly genes. And, uh, and, uh, and you can show that this uh, is, you, you can do by this uh, something that is called activity mapping. Uh, and this is very highly exploited. However, uh, there is more that you can do because when you know that the gene has its transcription activated uh, uh, by electrical activity or synaptic activity, you know that you have a promoter that is being activated. Uh, and uh, without going into the details, you can use this uh, experimentally to link to the promoter of, uh, of an immediate gene, a reporter gene that maybe can be useful for your, for your uh, subsequent experimental manipulations. And so this has been at the basis of a very, very successful set of studies. Now we are in the past eight to 10 years. Here you see that uh, in a cartoon-like way, you see that when, for instance, you give a, a shock to a rat or a mouse in, a, in, a, in this uh, spatial context, there is a set of neurons that are activated in the relevant uh, area of the brain, uh, here in the hippocampus or in the amygdala. And these red neurons are those that are activated by this uh, stimulus that creates an association between this shock and this spatial context. And then this uh, 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 these neurons uh, get uh, uh, enter into a dormant state, into a latent phase, and this is when uh, this information gets memorized. 
And if you measure the, 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 the fear memory, the fear uh, behavior of the, uh, in a different spatial context, the animal does not have a fear response. But then if you expose it to the same context, the animal has a very strong fear response. So now this is a learned fear experience. Now, if you exploit some genetic tricks to genetically tag the neurons that had been activated during this phase, during the learning, and for instance, you get them to uh, 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 express a protein with which uh, you can, for instance, a, an optogenetic protein that is a channel that is uh, activated by light, uh, this neuron, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, probe can be uh, uh, expressed uh, uh, in the neurons uh, that have been uh, undergone the learning experience. So when you shine the appropriate light on, on, these, uh, on these neurons, you can induce the uh, uh, freezing response or you can inhibit the freezing response. So basically you can reduce the uh, learning and memory experience to the experimental uh, activation or, or inhibition of the set of neurons that had encoded that particular learning experience. So these are studies by different groups in the, in the, in the world. And one pioneer in this, uh, in, this, uh, in this field, these are two pioneering uh, 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 papers by the group of Suzumo, Suzumo Tonegawa, in which uh, 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 there is some technicality here, but I, I'll simply, very simply uh, take you through this. You have a transgenic mouse in which, uh, under the promoter of a immature uh, 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 gene, you have uh, um, indirectly, uh, you drive the expression of an optogenetic uh, uh, protein so that a protein that upon blue light in, uh, uh, illumination will activate those neurons. And uh, uh, with, a, with a virus into this mouse, you uh, um, get introduced the expression of a transcription factor that induces uh, uh, in a combinatory way. So upon activation and upon the presence of a given drug, uh, doxycycline, you have a dual signal in which in a certain temporal window, if you shine blue light, you can reactivate those neurons that had been genetically labeled uh, during the learning experience. If you do this, and uh, without going into the details, uh, Tonegawa has shown that uh, you habituate uh, the mice uh, in a neutral context in the presence of an inhibitor of all uh, this machinery. Then you expose the mice to a shock in a different spatial context, context B, so that the neurons uh, that in which uh, uh, this association was made uh, uh, get activated. And because of this activation, they uh, uh, start uh, producing this protein, but this protein is not uh, excited. Then you bring the mouse back to the previous uh, 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 neutral cage, and now you shine the light to reactivate these yellow neurons. And now reactivating these yellow neurons in a light dependent way, you measure the fear response of the mice and the mice uh, 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 respond with a very strong fear response in a, in a, in a, in a, uh, in a light dependent way. So these and other experiments have shown that you can uh, identify uh, uh, cells that are the trace of the learned experience that encode the learned experience and that upon uh, reactivation of these neurons, you can recall that particular learned experience with a true memory or even with, with suitable experimental uh, 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 tricks, even you can induce a false memory. So the current view of the engram, uh, uh, of these engram technologies is that when you learn something, there is a cell assembly of active neurons that, you, that get activated. These neurons uh, uh, maybe strengthen the connections between them. They are, uh, get activated and then they enter into a latent uh, state. And upon uh, a recall of uh, the same or a partial combination of these uh, 
of these neurons, you you uh, 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 you recall the experience. And then here, this shows also another thing that the hippocampus, for instance, for spatial memory and episodic memory, is what encodes first the learning experience, and then this uh, uh, cell assembly is transferred for remote memory to uh, uh, the cortex. But this is another story. So this is our current view of engrams uh, uh, and how cell assemblies encode and mediate the recall of a given memory. However, I should also say that here the unit of learning and the unit of memory is the whole neuron. Because when you reactivate uh, uh, these, uh, these optogenetic proteins, uh, by the way, these optogenetic pro proteins allow us to demonstrate that that particular cell assembly is both necessary and sufficient for that particular memory experience. And when you reactivate with uh, channel rhodopsin or with these optogenetic proteins, the, uh, those neurons, you are stimulating the whole neuron. The, pr the protein is not expressed in any subcellularly defined way. Uh, 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 you can demonstrate this, that uh, uh, the channel, uh, the optogenetic protein is expressed throughout the neuron, so that when you uh, illuminate uh, uh, the tissue, the whole neuron gets activated. However, decades of uh, 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 experiments have also taught us, and we teach it, and we, and we learn it, and we, and, and we even write it in the papers that uh, synaptic plasticity is at the basis of learning and memory. And this is one of those uh, uh, mantra that, uh, that uh, in neuroscience is almost a truism. Uh, 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 and this uh, synaptic plasticity and memory hypothesis, this is a quotation from Richard Morris, who is a champion of this, uh, of this uh, 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 hypothesis, uh, states that uh, uh, changes, uh, uh, activity dependent synaptic plasticity, that is long-term changes uh, uh, induced at appropriate synapses during memory formations are both necessary and sufficient for the information storage underlying that particular type of memory. So we have here a gap and we have here a gap because uh, on one hand, the, the scale of synaptic plasticity is the scale of the single synapses of a neuron. Yet the engram theory and the engram results show us that the scale is the scale of the whole neuron. And one particular experimental preparation in which the synaptic plasticity has been very popularly uh, 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 demonstrated is a so-called uh, long-term potentiation in which you stimulate presynaptically uh, 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 an afferent fiber in the hippocampus in the CA3 region, and then you, you study the synapse in the CA1 region. And the, it, this synapse, if you give appropriate stimulations to this synapse, uh, 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 this synapse gets uh, uh, potentiated for a long term. And uh, uh, this is a particular uh, experiment in which you give a test stimulus, and this uh, gives the baseline synaptic response. Then you give uh, uh, some strong stimulation that can be varied. This is too long now to to go into detail, but suffice it to say that you give a strong stimulus, and then you go back to give the test stimulus. And now the response to the test stimulus is, is, lasts uh, for very long. So the same stimulus that previously gave this response now gives this response. So it's a, this synapse has been facilitated, has been potentiated. And uh, ex uh, important experiments show that uh, uh, if you give a weaker stimulation, uh, you have a, a, a short term, uh, uh, this is this type of simulation, you have a shorter, ter shorter term uh, potentiation. So now, uh, 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 um, there is, a, of course, this type of long term synaptic uh, facilitation has been uh, uh, thought to underline uh, uh, the learning and the memory uh, processes. And, and, and uh, uh, there are treat any, uh, many, many different treatments, uh, uh, hundreds of, of uh, if more, of, of experiments have shown that uh, treatments that affect long-term potentiation also affect memory and vice versa. Here I have only two examples in which on top you have the LTP experiment that we under certain treatment that is inhibited, and, and, and uh, on the bottom trace you have, uh, you have uh, a, a, a deficit in, in the memory 
uh, uh, corresponding memory test. However, this is, a, is, is by and large a correlation and you need to prove causality. And, and, and so you need to link the synaptic plasticity changes, long-term synaptic plasticity changes to long-term memories. And this, uh, uh, so uh, this was our starting point. So the success of the cellular engram uh, that uh, uh, results uh, show that uh, necessity and sufficiency for cellular engrams have been formally demonstrated in very, very elegant and convincing ways by different groups, uh, by experiments involving activity dependent reporter gene expression of the transcriptional level. These technologies have a cell wise spatial resolution, as I told you. And uh, so our question was uh, in order to link synaptic plasticity and memory, uh, uh, is there anything that is the equivalent of a synaptic engram? So instead of a cell assembly, that is these red neurons that, are, that encode and uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, mediate uh, the recall of a memory, uh, can we define a, a, a synaptic assembly that is a combination of synapses on a given population of neurons? And can we uh, 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 first identify them as a result of a learning experience? And second, can we uh, 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 perform necessity and sufficiency experiments with these. And, and uh, I will tell you the answer of the first. So this is what I, I, I will, I will uh, tell you today with this long introduction, but I wanted to give you, uh, uh, being a general talk, I wanted to give you the, the feeling and the, uh, of, of what type of experiment we, we, we want to do. So the questions in order to create a link between synaptic plasticity and memory is can we map potentiated synapses in living animals? That is the first uh, objective. Is there anything such thing as a synaptic engram? That is a trace that if you ablate it, you can uh, 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 not only uh, uh, inhibit the synaptic plasticity, but also inhibit the, the, the memory, but acting on the individual synapses that had been potentiated. And uh, the most difficult part, can we reactivate potentiated synaptic inputs and it is necessary and sufficient for memory recall. So this is the idea. Uh, the idea is, to, can we uh, uh, map a particular subset of uh, synapses during a learning experience? Uh, and by the way, we want to map potentiated spines. That is very different from mapping synapses that can be activated, as, for instance, with calcium uh, uh, input. So the way, this is what we set out to do. And uh, the way how we do it is, is to, again, always we, in order to develop a new method, we need to learn from biology. And this is, uh, has been a, a bit of a, of a, of a, but, uh, of a constant throughout my, 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 my way of doing experiments that we must uh, learn from biology and then uh, uh, squeeze it a bit uh, toward, towards your aim. And, and when you have a synapse that, is, uh, that gets activated, there is a lot of crosstalk between uh, the synapses and the nucleus where the DNA is. I told you that immediately genes are, 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 uh, are activated as a result of, of synaptic uh, uh, activation. And so there are signals that go from the activated synapses to the nucleus. When the stimulus is strong enough, uh, gene transcription is activated at the level of a nucleus, new genes are activated. So a neuron that has been stimulated activates a new transcriptional program. And some of these genes are the immediate genes that I told you about, and then uh, uh, as a cascade downstream of these Rs. And the interesting point is that because a transcription is a cell-wide phenomenon that concerns all the synapses of a nucleus, whereas synaptic plasticity is a very local effect and only affects a subset of the synapses of thousands of synapses of a, of a neuron that need to be potentiated or, in, or depressed, because of this, and because transcription is global, the RNAs coming from de novo transcription, many of these, hundreds of these, uh, travel again back to the, uh, in the dendritic arbor, but also in the axonal arbor, but here we are talking of dendrites, and they, trans uh, they travel in a translationally repressed way. So they are not translated into protein, you see this is, so they, they for instance, dock a, a synapse that had not been in, uh, activated. So this RNA that travels back 
coming from the novel transcription is translationally repressed, and so it doesn't make the protein. But this same RNA, that if it travels back to the signals that had been activated, that, that needed to be potentiated long term, this RNA now finds here a tag, a synaptic tag, as it's called, which derepresses the, the, the translation of that uh, RNA. And now that RNA makes a protein, and this protein and this set of proteins are responsible for the uh, 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 potentiation of this, uh, of this uh, uh, synapse. So we, this is a well, uh, I, I can't uh, cut a long field in, in just a, a, a slide, but I, uh, so you forgive me if I made it simple, but uh, uh, we uh, thought to exploit this mechanism to express a reporter protein, that means an artificial protein using this mechanism that could label the synapses that have been potentiated and not the synapses that have not been potentiated. So uh, uh, tag potentiated synapses. And, uh, and with this, uh, uh, our aim is, uh, can we map potentiated synapses in areas engaged by memory? And then uh, I will tell you more of what we can do with this. So by using this mechanism, this will be the first, uh, this is some uh, work that we have done and published. So here, the idea is the following. We exploit uh, a, an immediate gene that is called uh, ARC. It is a very potent gene whose uh, transcription is uh, activated by a synaptic stimulus. So these arrows show the crosstalk between synapses and nucleus and back. And we uh, create a vector uh, after we, we tried many different uh, concepts. I only show you the, the final one that works very well. And we made this concept in which the reporter gene in this case, this is the channel rhodopsin and the red fluorescent protein, but can be any protein of interest, as I will, you will show, I will show you in a while. And we create an RNA that has, uh, contains uh, five prime upstream and three prime downstream sequences of this uh, ARC immediately gene. And these sequences are responsible for the traffic of the RNA once it is transcribed to the synapses, into the dendrite. So these are RNA targeting sequences and we append these sequences upstream and downstream of the, uh, of the coding region of our reporter gene. And uh, on top of this, we have a second signal. Once this, so we predict that this protein should be locally translated in a, an activity dependent way, locally meaning close to the activated synapses. Now, in order to focus still more the expression of the reporter into the synaptic spine, that is this, we also add a protein coding sequence that has a very strong synaptic targeting sequence. So we combine an RNA targeting sequence with a protein targeting sequence. This is why we have a dual RNA and protein targeting signal. And uh, our control concepts are a sequence with only the protein targeting sequence that we call S, and we have a construct with only the RNA targeting sequence that we call R. So in the next experiments, you, you will have to compare SA with A or with S. And SA is the one that, that uh, should be more specific as predicted. And uh, uh, if we transpect this, uh, this if we express this uh, uh, construct into neurons, uh, uh, you show that, uh, 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 progressively uh, with, with, uh, with uh, uh, the protein coding sequence, the RNA coding sequence, the RNA targeting sequence or the combined, you see that uh, the, the staining that is the localization of the, of the uh, 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 reporter is, is, is progressively more, more, more localized. And you, you put this in the context of the whole neuron with a filler, you see that this only labels these two synapses into this, this uh, uh, and, and, and you can show that uh, you give many different treatments to these neurons and only the construct uh, uh, that, uh, that uh, has a dual signal is the one uh, whose uh, enrichment in the synapse is more strongly uh, uh, achieved. Uh, here you see, uh, just to show you a picture, you see a whole neuron filled with a filler, that is the magenta, 
and you see these green dots uh, that are the, 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 the labeling of the single synaptic uh, 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 spines uh, uh, in, uh, on the dendritic arbor. So you can really express a reporter in a very specific way. In this case, it is just a stimulation from uh, 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 pharmacological stimulation on the culture. And you can show that this uh, 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 reporter is really docked into the, into the head of the dendritic spine because uh, you can have a, make a careful localization with a, a synaptic scaffold protein at PSD. And you can show that the concept with the dual targeting is really docked uh, under the head of the spine. We, we have a, a, an experimental measure of the, of the docking according to the radius from the head of the spine. And, 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 uh, and, uh, and so uh, um, we can also show that this docking is, is, uh, is uh, dependent on the activation of NMD receptors in this, uh, in these, uh, uh, in these cultures, because this is uh, induced by NMD receptor activation. Uh, uh, another evidence that uh, this uh, labeling of the reporter is at spines that get uh, 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 potentiated is because a marker, a proxy marker for synaptic potentiation is the volume of the spine. There is ample literature that shows that the spine that undergoes potentiation has a larger volume. So measuring the spine volume is a proxy for measuring if a spine has been, has been uh, 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 potentiated. And we can measure spine volume by, by for instance, measuring the, 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 the uh, accumulation of a synaptic protein, in this case is Homer, and you see that the enrichment of the synaptic probe as a function of the level of proteins not only is linearly correlated, but it is super linearly correlated. So this again shows that the, our reporter accumulates into the dendritic uh, uh, spine, the potentiated dendritic spine. And uh, another sign of synaptic potentiation is that a spine that under a glutamatergic uh, uh, synapse, a postsynaptic spine at a glutamatergic synapse, uh, 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 undergoes upon potentiation exposure of uh, a, a class of receptors that are known AMPA receptors. Uh, this is the downstream of activation of NMD receptors via calcium calmodulin kinase that I will talk in a while. And so uh, if in these neurons we co-express the, 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 our synaptic probe uh, for, uh, we call it synactive, uh, our reporter, with, uh, with uh, an AMPA receptor that is, uh, uh, changes its fluorescence if it is exposed, uh, super ecliptic AGFP AMPA receptors. And we can show that for the dual uh, vector, there is a very nice linear correlation between the enrichment of the, of the synactive probe uh, versus the exposure of AMPA receptors, this linear correlation, whereas this correlation is not existing for the for the synactive, uh, for the probe that has not the dual RNA, uh, uh, protein targeting sequence. So this is another evidence that this is uh, uh, um, uh, uh, expressed at potentiated spines because I'm taking long time to convince you that we have a probe that's really labels potentiated spines because if we want to use this then in vivo, we need really to to, to be a, a rock solid proof that, uh, that uh, this is convincingly expressed as spines that are potentiated. Another demonstration of uh, 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 um, the, the, the activation, the, the expression of this probe in potentiated spines is done by a two photon glutamate and caging. Uh, uh, experiment in which uh, we give a cage the glutamate. You, uh, we can in a protocol in which uh, 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 you activate uh, uh, NMD receptors, and then you give plus or minus a protein synthesis inhibitor. And this experiment is shown here uh, 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 at the time course. I will show you in a while. So this red dot shows. Uh, 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 the particular spine of this dendritic branch that is uh, stimulated by uh, uh, a laser uh, uh, and, and, and the, uh, the, uh, the cell is bathed with a caged glutamate. And before uncaging, this is the spine. Uh, this neuron expresses also the, the, the synactive reporter. And uh, uh, one hour after the, uh, after the, the 
uh, the stimulation, you see that uh, the spine has grown and that now it expresses uh, the uh, 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 synactive uh, uh, reporter. And uh, if you follow this uh, uh, in time and you measure both the increase in volume and the increase in expression of the reporter, you see that the increase in volume follows this, uh, this uh, 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 curve that is very much reminiscent of what you get for a long term potentiation and the increase in expression of the uh, channel rhodopsin uh, and, uh, and fluorescent protein closely follows in time, a bit lagging, as you would expect, because it follows the stimulation. And, uh, and uh, this, uh, interestingly, is uh, very much uh, dependent on local protein synthesis, because uh, you, you, don't, uh, uh, you, don't, uh, 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 you don't have the long-term uh, uh, volume increase, and you don't have at all the uh, expression of the reporter. So the expression of the reporter is totally protein synthesis dependent. It, it is synaptic specific because it is not occurring at the blue synapse that has, the, it is a nearby synapse that has not been stimulated. So this uh, shows uh, uh, again that uh, it is protein synthesis dependent. Now, uh, uh, the particular reporter uh, uh, expressed at this, uh, in these neurons was an optogenetic probe. So since in perspective, we want to use optogenetic probe to reactivate those synapses, uh, we want to show in culture if uh, 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 by shining blue light onto this uh, 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 neuron that expresses uh, uh, this probe, uh, this uh, reactivation of the channel rhodopsin is able to stimulate the synapse. And so this is shown in, in a series of three different experiments. Now you are, optically activating uh, uh, synaptive uh, channel rhodopsin tag synapses. You measure with a calcium probe GCAMP uh, uh, the calcium response that is shown here. And you see that the calcium response is, uh, and you are shining blue light to activate the channel rhodopsin. And so you see that by activating the channel rhodopsin, you have a light dependent uh, uh, increase, uh, uh, influx of calcium in these, in these neurons. And this influx of calcium is dependent on, on, uh, on, uh, on uh, calcium on uh, entry through calcium voltage dependent calcium channels. So this is a sign of synaptic activation by shining blue light and uh, uh, by is not dependent on, on, uh, on uh, ambient uh, synaptic uh, uh, transmission because it is still there in, in tetrodotoxin. And this increase is, uh, is uh, well, uh, this we can skip. Uh, uh, something that happens when you activate a synapse is uh, calcium calmodulin kinase to phosphorylation, that is this step. And so if we measure uh, with a very sensitive antibody, cal the, the phosphorylation of, of, uh, of uh, calcium calmodulin kinase, you see these dots after stimulating with blue light, you see that uh, uh, you have uh, a, a very nice uh, uh, activation of uh, calcium calmodulin kinase phosphorylation and that is uh, uh, quantified, uh, uh, and you don't have it in the dark, in the light, but not in the dark. You see it here. This is in the light, and this is in the dark. And this uh, uh, also is, is again, uh, very specific. And finally, the optical activation of synactive channel rhodopsin tag synapses drives also the uh, uh, activation of, uh, of uh, nuclear transcription of immediate genes. So, in principle, if you reactivate uh, a synapse you, uh, uh, expressing locally in a protein synthesis and activity dependent manner channel rhodopsin, you should be able to reactivate uh, 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 the whole neuron. And so this is, uh, uh, we can, so now this is a conclusion of this part and uh, I, I went uh, long. Uh, I, uh, if you give me 10 minutes, I will take you through what uh, uh, do I have 10 minutes or, or, or should I? Uh, please go ahead, Antonino. Please. I'm sorry. I, I noted, just noticed that uh, anyway, I, this, this shows a proof of concept that we can uh, uh, express any, uh, 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 in particular, a difficult report that is channel rhodopsin at potentiated synapses in a, in a potentiation dependent way. So now, depending on the reporter and on the actuator that we can. Um, put in our synaptic vector, we can pose different experimental questions. And now I'll give you a flavor of what we are doing with this technology. 
uh, well, actually, this was already done in, in our first paper in which we, we used uh, this system in vivo to see if we could map potentiated synapses in vivo. Uh, I will skip this because it is published. Uh, uh, I will show you uh, uh, some ongoing work. Here, the idea is to uh, uh, map potentiated uh, spines, uh, these green spines uh, in vivo, uh, 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 in the course of a learning and memory protocol. And we can, uh, uh, the format in which we have this is in an inducible way. So with a doxycycline dependent system, this is a, is a, is a teton. Now, the, for those of you who know it, this is a bit technical, but this simply uh, is a way to uh, uh, only open, in vivo there are lots of things that go on. Uh, all synapses get on and off all the time, as you can imagine. So you only, want to study uh, synapses that are potentiated during a very, very well-controlled temporal window that as an experimental you control uh, related to a, to a, to a learning uh, uh, task. And so uh, this is a particular construct. We, we, in this case, we use in ultra electroporation to express these uh, constructs in the hippocampus, but now we have, uh, as you will show you in a while, a platform of viral vectors. So here is experimental uh, design to, uh, uh, the idea here is to, to do imaging of potentiated synapses during encoding and retrieval phase of a memory. You have uh, 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 these uh, uh, experimental groups, you have a fear conditioning paradigm uh, in which animals, I told you before, form an association between the spatial context and the food shock, and you have uh, uh, and you give this, uh, this uh, injection means that you open the, the window of opportunity to label potentiated spines if these synapses get potentiated, should get potentiated. And so this is when you give, you open the window of opportunity. And then uh, uh, here, uh, either you keep the animals in the home cage or you give them uh, fear conditioning in context A. And then in another group, you give them fear conditioning in context A and then uh, uh, on day three, you do a recall, you expose them again to the context in which you have, they had been shocked. And then the control group is you give the shock in context A, but then you probe them the recall in context B in a different context. And so uh, uh, now uh, uh, this simple experiment, uh, 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 we use all the same constructs that, uh, that I showed you before. Here, the aim is not uh, no channel rhodopsy, no optogenetic probe, it's simply to use a fluorescent label of potentiated spines, uh, uh, and we map these onto neurons that uh, have been activated or not by a, an independent immediately gene expression. So we combine the uh, 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 measure of uh, which spines get, uh, which synapses get potentiated uh, onto neurons that are bona fide engram or non engram cells. And our definition of engram neurons here is by extension to independent work in a, 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 a population of neurons that express in a task dependent way any uh, uh, metallic gene. So we do this in the hippocampus and we, in this case, in, in the CA1 area, we measure potentiated uh, synapses along with the dendritic arbor of, the, of, the, of, of a pyramidal CA1 neuron. So here the idea is to map potentiated synapses after uh, uh, fear conditioning or, or after recall in different layers of the hippocampus. And, uh, and uh, this complicated slide only shows that uh, if you do this in the four groups, uh, uh, you see that you have uh, the, uh, a layer dependent. Uh, 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 first of all, you, you see that with respect to animals that are, have remained in the home cage, uh, uh, animals that have been fear conditioned or uh, uh, have uh, undergone recall, all have a greater number of potentiated spines in all four groups, you see. However, uh, 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 then you see more different, uh, the interesting differences are the differences between the fear condition uh, uh, the, uh, and, and, and the recall synapses. You see here in the, uh, uh, that in the proximal stratum radiatum and in the distal uh, stratum radiatum, you have a, a difference between, uh, uh, between uh, uh, the different groups. And so this already shows that uh, uh, there is, for, it, uh, for instance, in the proximal stratum radiatum, a difference between uh, uh, 
uh, uh, uh, other layers, for instance, in the strato lacunoso molecular, that is uh, uh, the more distal uh, uh, layer. And uh, now you do the same in the neurons that have, uh, uh, that are labeled with, uh, uh, as a bona fide engram neuron. So we do the same, this is a total distribution across all the neurons of the hippocampus, C1, regardless of whether they are engram or non-engram. And now you do the same experiment by doing uh, double, uh, measuring the potentiated synapses either in engram or in non-engram. And now you see again that, uh, for instance, in the, uh, during recall, you see that uh, you have these very significant differences, a larger number of uh, potentiated synapses, the, the turquoise, uh, synapses with respect to the uh, potentiated synapses in non-engram cells. And if you give the recall with a neutral, uh, uh, with a neutral uh, context, you, you see the opposite. You don't see, uh, you see that the potentiated spines are less. So these uh, potentiated spines are in larger number than uh, in engram neurons. And, and uh, uh, the conclusion of these experiments is that synaptic traces overlap with cellular memory traces. And if you do a correlation analysis, you see another interesting thing that after fear conditioning, the, 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 uh, you have more potentiated synapses in these two layers, stratum aureus and stratum lacunoso moleculare. Whereas uh, after the specific recall, you have uh, a specific uh, 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 localization of potentiated spines into the stratum radiatum. So we can, uh, uh, envision a, a, a scenario in which during learning you 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 have uh, mostly you activate uh, uh, these uh, these synapses, whereas uh, during recall now you reactivate uh, uh, mostly uh, synapses in and you put and you reactivate synapses that have been potentiated in the stratum radiatum. So this goes uh, some way to uh, 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 plan experiments that we are doing now to express in this way uh, optogenetic probes either to interfere or to, or to uh, reactivate these type of synapses to see if you can interfere with that memory. But in the meantime, there is uh, another question that we, you can ask. And, and, uh, and this is, uh, we have been labeling uh, uh, potentiated uh, postsynaptic sites. Uh, it would be very interesting to identify the presynaptic partner of a potentiated spine as opposed to the presynaptic partner of a spine that has not been potentiated. And, and, uh, and there, if you could do this, you, there are many things that you could do, for instance, even to label the presynaptic neuron body at a very distance. Uh, the first thing to do is to create a fluorescence measure that is diagnostic of a presynaptic, postsynaptic uh, uh, partner that has undergone potentiation as opposed to a presynaptic and postsynaptic partner that has not undergone potentiation. And to do so, we have uh, developed a, a synaptic version of the GRASP. GRASP is a GFP reconstitution across synaptic partner. You use a split GFP, Half of the, uh, uh, and you need, in order to create fluorescence, you need uh, both the, the, the one half of the GFP and the other half of the green fluorescent protein. And in order to, to uh, uh, we express the presynaptic uh, GFP uh, in the presynaptic neuron, and we express the postsynaptic GFP in the postsynaptic neuron with, uh, and this is the standard grasp. But now we have introduced uh, uh, the variation that is the postsynaptic grasp now is synactive. So this is a reporter that is only expressed in a potentiation dependent way. So not all postsynaptic partners will be expressing the, 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 the GFP moiety, uh, the second half of the GFP, but only those synapses that have been undergoing potentiation. So uh, uh, this is illustrated in this cartoon here. This, uh, uh, the presynaptic partner expresses the one half of the fluorescent protein. The postsynaptic partner expresses the second uh, half of the fluorescent protein in a potentiation dependent way. So this synapse that uh, the theory is that this synapse that is uh, undergoing potentiation because of how I stimulate it should become fluorescent. 
This synapse that is not being potentiation should not show the grass signal. We used exactly the same construct that was used in this uh, Choi et al. paper uh, a few years ago. And uh, this cost, the, the variation now is that the postsynaptic partner is expressed with our activity dependent synaptive uh, uh, probe. And uh, I'll take you through very, 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 very simple, uh, very rapidly. Uh, this works uh, remarkably well. You see this, uh, now this is in culture. This is, uh, is these dots here are the fluorescence that has been reconstituted because a presynaptic partner uh, is opposed to a postsynaptic synapse that has been potentiated. And in order uh, uh, to prove this, there is a, a number of pharmacological experiments that you can do. For instance, uh, uh, blocking in the culture the NMDA receptor. Uh, 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 first, we induce this signal is dependent on inducing LTP in culture. But if then you block NMDA receptors, uh, uh, for instance, in these green bars, you see that uh, uh, you compare the blue bars with the green bars, and, and, uh, and uh, this is a potentiation dependent grasp signal, and this is NMDA receptor dependent potentiation uh, signal. So it, this is, is, is a very uh, nice proof, and we can do other variations on the theme. But uh, you, can, you can do very careful co-localization studies also with the AMP receptors again. But I wanted to show you can do this in vivo. So in vivo, of course, you need to play a trick because uh, the trick is that if you, uh, you don't want that the same neuron co-expresses uh, 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 the two moieties. And since we are giving them with, uh, with adeno-associated viral vectors, we exploit uh, the interhemispheric connection between uh, the presynaptic CA3 versus the postsynaptic CA1 of the other hemisphere. So we are sure that the two constructs are not co-expressed in the same neuron. Then we give, uh, 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 we, 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 uh, we inject uh, at this age the viruses bilaterally. Then we wait uh, uh, the necessary time. We then we bring the animal in the cage. Then we open the window opportunity with doxycycline. Then we do the behavioral test uh, uh, with foot shock. And then 24 hours later, we do the perfusion and we study the, 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 the green fluorescence. And you see here that in the CA1 neurons that are filled with the filler here, uh, uh, you have all these, uh, these uh, green dots that are synapses that have been reconstituted the fluorescence because uh, uh, they have been stimulated by the stimulus, by the learning experience, and, uh, and, uh, and they have been potentiated. And we can do a number of measurements on these. And in particular, for instance, we can, we can show that uh, mice that have undergone condition, fear conditioning, have higher number of, of grass positive synapses than uh, mice that have remained in the, in the home cage. And uh, if you give a much stronger stimulus, of course, you have a much, uh, this is a very non-specific stimulus, but it, it is needed to see that if you have a massive stimulation, you have a very strong uh, signal. And of course, you have a control, you don't give doxycycline, you don't see signal, et cetera. So this is, uh, now the presynaptic partner can be, uh, uh, this can be used now as a very clean way of imaging in vivo. And we are using this uh, now uh, this is our current platform to study. Uh, now we are creating the connection with uh, Alzheimer's disease because you can, you can study now, uh, you can also make many different calculations on measuring, for instance, the clustering of synapses between, uh, between uh, 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 how these synapses are localized uh, on the dendritic branches, between the dendritic branches. Uh, this, these are type of data that computational neuroscientists are very eager to have because many computational models depend on, uh, on knowing very carefully where uh, the synaptic inputs uh, that induce potentiation are localized, how they need to be localized in order to drive efficiently uh, uh, the activity in the neuron, et cetera, et cetera. So we are collaborating with Yota Koirazzi uh, providing her data uh, that she then is using uh, uh, for, the, for, her, for her models. And this is uh, coming towards our, our, 
our goal that is to extend this data on, uh, on, uh, in an Alzheimer context. Last, uh, very last point, just to give you a flavor. We can do uh, 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 proteomics of potentiated synapse. Uh, what is the molecular composition of potentiated spines in vivo? So this is a totally different question. Now we have a handle on a spine and we can want to ask the question, what is the molecular composition of that spine as opposed to the, another spine of the same neuron that has not been potentiated. Now this question becomes possible. At the moment, if you do prote synaptic proteomics, you can only take a brain and make a homogenate. The best that you can do now is uh, you take a brain in which you have uh, expressed uh, in a cell neuron type specific uh, uh, a proteomic hook and then do cell type specific proteomics but you cannot do, here, you, here we, we, we can do subcellular state dependent proteomics. And this is uh, uh, just a flavor. We, the idea is we use this probe with, with, a, with, a, with a proteomic handle. In this case, we have a PST handle uh, with, with which we want to study the interactome of PST95. And uh, we are using a method that has been used to do the PST95 interactome in the past. So we use, we know on, on, on known uh, uh, uncharted routes. And so this again is, is a workflow. We inject the virus, we do behavior, we immunoprecipitate, but now the probe is very, very specifically expressed. And we do mass spectrometry and we do computational analysis. And this is uh, a PhD student in collaboration with the proteomic group in Germany. And the idea here is to do proteomics of single potentiated spines and we have the control that is proteomics of all the spines of the neuron. We have our first data sets. We are going uh, towards potentiation specific interatomic changes. And of course, it will be very interesting to do this in an Alzheimer context. And uh, so to conclude, uh, uh, this is a slide with which I started the, the seminar. The question was, is there a synaptic engram? I, I told you that we need, in order to answer this question, to answer if these are actually an engram, we need to have new experimental tools. These new experimental tools have now been, I think, convincingly developed. And so necessity and sufficiency questions about synaptic engrams can now be addressed. And this is our dream experiment that we are slaving towards. Uh, we would like to repeat uh, the experiments that have been done with neuron tagging, uh, do them by synaptic tagging and, uh, and in ways that I showed you. And so maybe we have light at the end of the tunnel and uh, I, uh, this was the Alzheimer tunnel. We would like to extend these technologies to the Alzheimer uh, and, uh, a field and exploit the synaptic platform in the context of Alzheimer's investigations, combining this platform with Alzheimer targets, models, questions. And uh, this is my synaptic group uh, 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 Francesco Gobba was a very, very talented. Uh, 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 he, he, he really, this project started with a single-handed, uh, talented uh, PhD student, Francesco Gobbo. He's now uh, doing a postdoc in Richard Morris. He has been really, he started this, uh, this work single-handed. And now this is my, uh, a group of very, Marco Mainardi is a ricercatore and uh, he's now at CNR and uh, Ajesh, Andrea, Francesca, Maria Chiara are PhD students. We collaborate on the proteomics with, uh, with Vienna. And uh, importantly, a group at EBRI, uh, the group of Silvia Marinelli, she's a, 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 a talented uh, PI uh, electrophysiologist and with her group, we are, we are studying uh, how microglia is targeted towards potentiated versus non-potentiated synapses. And we are dreaming about doing the similar approach uh, for instead than for excitatory neurons for inhibitory neurons. And I thank you very much for your attentions. And I like uh, closing with, uh, with a, a, a nice memory for my mentor, Rita Levi Montalcini. Thank you very much indeed. And sorry for being very late. Thank you. Thank you, Antonino. It, it has been an amazing talk and the question session is open and you can raise your hand and, and pose your question.
please. Hi, Matthew. Matthew. Oh. Yes. Hi, Antonino. Um, Hi, Matthew. Nice to see you. Yes, same here. I don't, my video is not on, but you know what I look like. So, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, thank you very much. It's extremely interesting. Um, I'd like to know what you, you, you emphasized a rapid one shot learning, especially fear learning. I'd like to know what prospects you see for this kind of methodology for these probes, for the many other kinds of learning, in particular kinds of learning that show major deficits with uh, with Alzheimer's kinds of dementia, working memory, things like that, which are not one-shot learning? Yes, of course, the question is is very important one. Uh, um, one reason for, for focusing at the moment, we are focusing on, uh, at the moment, what we need is, is, is a simple, or rather simple, well-defined uh, uh, behavioral task in which the engram the cellular engram concept has been well demonstrated even the cellular engram context has focused very much on fear conditioning as you know mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, and so in that context uh, uh, even in that context the extension to more sophisticated behavioral uh, uh, tasks more relevant for um, not only Alzheimer's disease, but also other uh, uh, situations is yet not really well established. So the, the point is very well taken. You are right. Uh, our approach has been conservative to follow the path of what the cellular uh, uh, engram people have done in a quite convincing way. Uh, I should say um, that uh, um, there has been a paper by, the, by Hayashi Tagachi et al. Uh, group in Japan in which they studied the memory uh, 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 task and the memory, a mo sorry, a motor uh, memory task. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and they have been able with a conceptually similar approach to irreversibly ablate a memory by reversibly ablating uh, a set of spines. So, uh, uh, that type of memory, uh, motor memory, is something that might be directly amenable also to this uh, to this uh, concept. But uh, okay. Okay. Um, sorry, if I could keep going, just because I am very interested in this topic, of course. Um, for, for, so let's make the question a bit more biological. Consider memories that don't that are formed, but they they don't stay there. Working memory. It's, it's a form of memory, but you can have it for seconds or minutes. Do you think that that's fundamentally, biologically, a different kind of engram, the kind of engram that gets erased and then substituted by new one when new information has to be stored and recalled? Uh, do you think that that's biologically a different kind of mechanism from the kind of me uh, memory that is formed and then remains there? Uh, I think, uh, this is my prejudice, I think that the type of memories that might be studied uh, by this approach, uh, well, I, I, I remove, I think, uh, from, a, for, from an operational point of view. This is why I said I think. Uh, the way how this system works is that it is dependent on local protein synthesis. So uh, I think that the, those memories that depend on local protein synthesis at the synapse for their functioning, uh, uh, could be studied by this approach if, if then you solve other problems. I, I, I think that the, the type of working memories that you are thinking of uh, uh, might not uh, depend on protein, uh, local protein synthesis. And uh, so, so I think that the prerequisite experiments that I would do uh, in any specific case uh, that I want to, to ask if this method is applicable to is make a protein synthesis dependence test. Okay. That is that is the way how I, for instance, uh, one thing that I, I, if I can stay on this, uh, um, there are there are processes that are possibly not necessarily memories, but are more. Uh, I'm thinking of sensory plasticity, for instance, and this type of phenomena. Uh, I think also these might be might be amenable to being studied with these uh, approaches, but also in that case, I would I would uh, I would uh, look. Uh, the role of protein, uh, local protein synthesis. That is uh, how I would answer your question. 
Okay, I got the key word as protein syn synthesis. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. This is because uh, the functioning of that uh, of the method depends on that. So it okay. is an oper that is what I said the operational definition of the method. I see. Okay, thank you. Antonio, may I may I ask a question? Just a, a curiosity. You have uh, you have showed that you started to do proteomics uh, on uh, on uh, potentiated synapses by using these tools. Do you have any hint on enrichment for transcription factors at this level? <laughs> yes, we we find uh, uh, we find a, a strange. Uh, <laughs> I consider strange proteins as it were, proteins that you would not expect and which makes life difficult because uh, 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 here we are trying to, to uh, uh, develop uh, a, 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 an order of magnitude more sensitive way of looking at subcellular state dependent proteomics. Mm -hmm. And in order to, 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 to be convincing, you don't want to start with unexpected <laughs> proteins, <laughs> if I can, if you understand. So the answer is, 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 is uh, alas, yes, we see, we see proteins that we would not expect, but we need to make sense of the whole picture. We are, we are struggling with these lists, yes. Okay, thank you. But we are very convinced that we have specific lists. This is very, okay. So not, not ge generic transcription factors, but just uh, s some ones. Someone, yes. Thank you. There are some questions in the in the chat. I see. There I don't know if what you want. I mean, how you want to go about with those? Yeah. Yes, we have another question by Enrico Don Giorgi. Okay, Enrico, you are unmuted. Please go ahead and ask your question. Hello, Antonino. Ciao. Ciao Enrico. Um, so, uh, of course, I, I like your, your presentation very much. Uh, and I was in particular um, very um, um, inspired by the differential uh, expression of the, um, of the synaptic tag in the different layers of the hippocampus. So, um, concerning the fact that you see uh, the initial learning involving synapses in the stratum orients, uh, while the recall mainly in the uh, stratum radiatum. Is there any uh, explanation from this? I mean, uh, one of the things that I was thinking at is that uh, in the stratum orients, you have also terminations uh, from other uh, type of neurons, like the serotonergic neurons, uh, are all uh, uh, forming synapses in the stratum orients of the CA1, or you do have also extra hippocampal um, uh, synapses coming from the interrenal cortex, while in the stratum uh, radiatum, the majority of synapses are coming from the intrahippocampal synapses. Mm -hmm. So have you, have you made a thought about this? Uh, yes, Enrico. Uh, first of all, let me. First of all, before answer, so no, I first answer the question, then I make a comment afterwards. So yes, that's a very good point, and uh, and in fact, uh, we do think that uh, that this uh, uh, we found that this uh, we call it maturation uh, of of the of the pattern of uh, potentiated synapses along the dendritic arbor of these K1 neurons is a very interesting fact. And it is new and not totally uh, uh, expected. If if you were to do it electrophysiologically, you would you would have to 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 uh, uh, record uh, uh, local in different layers. But uh, we think that that is due to 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 different inputs, as as you correctly point point uh, that are also activated. And in fact, this type of results was also one motivation uh, to to do the to to develop the grasp. Uh, we realize that it is important to, to, to identify uh, the, the presynaptic partner in an unequivocal way. And so that is part of the motivation for, for developing also the GRASP approach. Uh, I hope this answers your question. I don't have the answer to why it is so, 
but uh, I'm afraid that you will have to be satisfied with this, <laughs> I hope. And, uh, but I, I, I want to take the opportunity to, to say how glad I am to hear you. For those of you who do not know, Enrico in the, in the 90s, we were together at Bella Vista. She was in my group and then uh, uh, he was, uh, uh, we were discovering uh, the BDNF uh, RNA activity dependent and dritted targeting of BDNF RNA. Very nice times. Ciao, Enrico. That, that was very <laughs> great times. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Antonino. And there are a couple of questions in the chat. Please, Antonino, feel free to answer them. So I will start from the first. Why didn't you do a, an actual pair recording to five pets patch clamp experiment to further link activity dependent plasticity induction states, spike time dependent plasticity with your synapse labeling? Uh, great question. For the, the quick answer is, uh, is uh, 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 I'm not myself an electrophysiologist, as I think it was clear from the talk, but uh, uh, this is something that now, uh, but this was the, the short answer, but uh, uh, it is a very good suggestion and uh, we want it first, uh, we are now going into that, and, uh, and uh, we, we want it first to be uh, convinced uh, by, by, by the fact that the probe really labeled the uh, uh, synapses that were uh, um, potentiated by a number of different criteria. But that's what we are doing with uh, co electrophysiologist colleagues. Marco Maynard is one and Silvia Marinelli is another one. Thank you for the question, it's a very good one. And uh, is calcium blockers also block uh, channel rhodopsin ionic conduction? No, uh, uh, our experiment showing that, uh, that's a good question. Uh, I forgot saying it. Uh, 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 the the uh, we, um, experiment which we could block the the optogenetically activated uh, uh, calcium influx with uh, inhibitors uh, was due to an actual block of calcium influx through voltage dependent calcium channels and not uh, 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 through um, channel rhodopsin. Uh, third question, upon reactivation of the engram spines quotation, would you expect an unnatural synchronous activation inhibition by opsins? Recapitulate physiological memory recall. Uh, yes, uh, this is the expectation. The inhibition is a straightforward expectation, and this is uh, uh, what we are uh, 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 aiming at first. And the reactivation is. Uh, that's, a, I would say, a prediction slash uh, uh, hope. In other words, even if an engram spine, if a, if a, if a synaptic assemble uh, was uh, responsible for uh, encoding a given, a given memory, there is always the possibility that the reactivation might not be strong enough, specific enough, uh, these type of problems that are more related. So if the sufficient, if the reactivation experiment is not uh, positive, I wouldn't say it per se it would rule out the expectation, but uh, for technical reasons. But yes, that's, that's the expectation. I don't know if this answers your question. And uh, Elena Georgievska, I was quite convinced. Uh, thank you for the talk. Prego. <laughs> How complex, simple should the model of memory be given the enormity of variables down the organizational scale of a neuron? Do you mean, I think, uh, in, an experimental memory, model of memory? I think this might be related to, to, to Matthew Diamond's question. If, uh, if this same... Uh, prediction might apply to more complex memories such as epi episodic memories or, or complex. Uh, I really, uh, we shall know by doing experiments, I'm afraid. I'm sorry, I cannot give a better answer to this one. Ah, sorry, sorry, sorry. I didn't. I didn't scroll the. Uh, I, I I didn't scroll. So, uh, uh, 
uh, uh, Domenico Guarascio, very nice talk and big work. Thank you very much again. What do you expect to see in the Alzheimer model? Uh, well, you know that uh, really the, the, the quick one would be to see uh, uh, changes in the, in the, in the way uh, the, it depends in which phase uh, you do the experiments. Uh, uh, there might be defects in the translational machinery, in the local translation machinery. So there might be, and this might be a way of, of probing local translation in, in conditions. Really what I think, uh, uh, so then here we expect to see uh, 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 deficits of a type or another. And again, this is a bit of a fishing, uh, the Alzheimer part initially is going to be finding the right moment, the right, uh, the right model. Uh, my, my real, I think my dream experiment would be uh, a bit more uh, sophisticated than just uh, uh, take a whole Alzheimer model. I would like doing experiments, but these are down the line. It's, it's not uh, in, in which you combine this type of experiments uh, with, with the neurons that express Alzheimer proteins or don't express Alzheimer proteins. So I'm interested in the cell autonomous uh, mechanism of Alzheimer. So I'd like to compare the expression of Alzheimer misfolded proteins and uh, of protector intrabody, for instance, intrabodies expressed at the spines in this way, uh, this type of experience. So I'd like to combine uh, 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 cell autonomous uh, 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 expression of either misfolded proteins or uh, uh, um, protectors of misfolded proteins locally, locally in the neuron and locally in the synapses. These are the type of experiments that I'm thinking ahead, but maybe it's too long ahead. I don't know. And, uh, and uh, um, microglia. Uh, interaction between uh, potentiated and non-potentiated spines uh, in an Alzheimer context or a wild type context, that is something I, I expect uh, a, a big answer from. And these expense we are doing with Silvia Marinelli. And uh, so again, Elena Georgievska, given that this gene is gene activation protein dependent, et cetera, is it possible that the disease affecting memory process like dementia may be reversible? at least partially, ah, not, uh, uh, well, this approach uh, will, will not uh, allow that. Uh, uh, this approach will, will, will tell us something hopefully about mechanism and about reversibility of, uh, of neurodegeneration, I think is all a question of uh, uh, what phase uh, uh, you can uh, uh, access it. I think that there, that there might be a stage yes. in which, yes, okay. And uh, Paul raises his hand. And, uh... Thanks. Yes. Hi. Thank you. Uh, hi. That was a fantastic talk and a great talk. I hi, guess Paul, I, I had a couple of technical questions. But yes. I guess my real question is: Are you moving to version two of this probe, or are you, or are you satisfied with it as it is? I mean, does it? What about the half life? Does it move out of spines? Um, Etc. Or do you, or are you satisfied? You know, is, is is there a graded response, or is it really all or nothing, or are you, are you actually trying to improve it even further? So my my uh, half of myself uh, is probably three quarters uh, of myself is to move uh, uh, on on a 2.0 version, uh, but because for instance, one point that I think. Uh, I'd like to, to improve is, uh, you, you touch rightly, uh, is, is, is uh, uh, um, to improve on locality. Uh, but I think that the GRASP version introduced, uh, let me make a comment here, introduced an unexpected, uh, uh, the GRASP version is already unexpectedly a 2.0 version because if you have only a, a GFP, or whatever at the uh, at the at the postsynaptic uh, uh, side with no with no other contribution, that has some noise. Whatever nice pictures you show, uh, there is some movement uh, out of the dendrite. There is some somatic labeling, although less than what we uh, feared. 
So uh, that is a technical point that you are right in pointing out. We made the grasp version for a totally, uh, for a non-technical reason, for a biological reason. That was uh, the reason to identify at a distance the presynaptic partner. But when we do the grasp in vivo with the presynaptic partner that is only uh, 10 amino acids of a GFP that is presynaptically appended to a neurexin uh, 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 transmembrane domain, that is unintendedly, admittedly unintendedly, it filters out uh, all non-specific signal on the postsynaptic neuron. Because if you have the postsynaptic moiety out of the synaptic uh, domain of influence, that will not become fluorescent. So that is a totally unintended but very happy 2.0 version that we are now using that one to, to, for imaging because it is a beautiful filtering device. It, device, it, it filters out all non-specific signal. So I'm afraid you'll have to wait for the 3.0 call. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> it, it makes sense then, thank you. I just saw a, 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 a hello by Massimo Righi and I just take the opportunity uh, uh, to, ciao Massimo. <laughs> Va bene, sorry. Uh, there is, um, well, there is a flattering comment, thank you, but uh, I don't know by whom, but uh, A, and anyway, thank you, thank you. My honor to talk at CISA, really, it's a pleasure. And don't think you can escape it, I will come there <laughs> and drink uh, Prosecco. Okay, on uh, behalf uh, of the colloquium team, I thank everyone for their participation, and especially Antonino Catania, of course. And uh, we see you all uh, at the next uh, CISA colloquium. Bye, have a, have a nice evening. Ciao a tutti, grazie mille. Thank Ciao, you very Antonio, much indeed. Ciao. Ciao. Thank Ciao. you very much indeed. And I... Antonino. Ciao. Ciao, ragazzi. Ciao, grazie. Ciao, ciao.